you know, there's lots of students tonight, raise your hand, starting your career and really interested in this stuff. So could you share with our students tonight why parking, why room planning? How did you get into this whole field as a career? What well, motivated you? It was so long ago, I hardly remember. I think I backed in. Uh, the, uh, I did my PhD dissertation on the um, urban landmark, and I've always been interested in how land is used until, and I, I guess I became really interested in parking, but I realized that parking is the single biggest land use in almost every city. The more land devoted to parking there is, than there is to the footprint of houses or schools or any other kind of building, parking is the single uh, biggest land use, and it seems to be almost unmanaged. There's, there's no prices for it. Everybody in the land economics talks about land prices, but most parking is free. So I thought that uh, there was a huge uh, lack of economic uh, economic approach towards it, and uh, and it was also neglected by just about every every, every other academic. In academia, there's very uh, real status gradation. You know, international affairs are very important and then national affairs are a step down. The state affairs are, affairs are definitely lower than that. And the municipal affairs are parochial. And then in the city government, parking is at the bottom of the prestige ladder. Um, so, so I think I, I was a bottom feeder. <laughs> but there's a lot of food at the bottom. And, and I, I've enjoyed Thank you. Very helpful. So I got the slides up real quick. So very quickly, I just want to kind of ground us after that really, really helpful whirlwind tour of parking policy opportunities. So many out there. We all have parking spaces in our neighborhoods. Um, but really, most of us have communities that look like this. And what, what we'd, we'd much rather see are streets like this where homes are affordable, where there's less traffic, where people have lots of safe, healthy ways to get around most of the time and drive if they need to. So most of you have probably heard about Green Trip certification, basically our LEED type certification focused on how green it is to get you to do development. And Mayor Bates uh, addressed this project recently that went through the planning process and we basically got them to convert uh, a $2.3 million parking garage, 49 spaces, and literally transformed that into a plethora of just a smorgasbord of transportation amenities from free transit passes, a private get around pod just for the residents, a free membership, bike parking in every unit, underground, on the surface, on the street. They got bike link cards, $10 value to bike fixing stations, kiosks, bike, or what I call pedestrian trunks, basically grocery carts. But you know, all these things that, that matter that really help and incentivize folks to drive less and uh, use other alternatives. Another um, effort that we've been pursuing, thanks to the HUD Sustainable Communities Grant and MTC, um, Jennifer West has been working hard to gather all this data. We're gonna do 100 sites of uh, parking utilization around the region, and in our first round of sites, just 22 projects, uh, 463 unused spaces out of almost a thousand, or 1,400, and so 30% of those practically are unused, you know, counting it all up at a conservative price, you know, it's $10 million just sitting there unused. So we want to um, categorize that, find all that data, get it into this database so you see we're having focus groups coming up, so if you're interested, please let us know. We'd love to get your input on how you would best want to use this in your communities to shape projects, shape downtown planning efforts um, and so I just want to flash that real quick thanks for your so time. first question from Jackie Stiazzi from Kaiser so what are some strategies for convincing employers that the cost of providing parking is high compared to the cost of encouraging alternative commute modes well, I, I, I would recommend parking cash out uh, the idea that if you think that, <laughs> that it's more expensive to, to um, subsidize alternatives or encourage alternatives to provide free parking. There's a state law uh, about parking cash out that applies to some employers who rent parking spaces for their, uh, to offer free to their employees. And for those employers, 
they have, if they rent the parking spaces from a third party to offer free to their employees, they have to offer the employees the option to take the cash value that the employer would have spent on renting a parking space and giving it, and being able to use the cash to ride the bus or bicycle or roller skate or anything else. So it isn't uh, subsidizing bicyclists more than automobile drivers. It sounds very generous, doesn't it, compared to what we do now. But it's just giving the same subsidy to everybody regardless of how they get to work. So it's what, what seems like just treating everybody equally it is a huge giveaway to the bicyclists or the pedestrians, but it isn't. It's just treating everybody equally. So I think it reveals to the employer how much they are spending to subsidize solo driving. And it, in some uh, companies that, that, um, that have done this, it led to more equal uh, subsidies as well, because in any organization, some of the top people get reserved parking spaces, and then the next lower people get uh, random parking spaces, and the lowest people maybe get no parking spaces or cheaper parking spaces farther away. But once it's revealed, that, gee, uh, Mayor Bates has offered a parking subsidy for $300 a month, and, and his secretary is getting a park, <laughs> would be getting a parking subsidy of $100 a month. They, they change the policy, give everybody the same amount, the same subsidy. So I think if you, have, you offer cash out, saying that I have to offer you whatever I offer you in a parking subsidy, reveals these subsidies and makes people think about them differently. So I think it's a state law. Um, it's uh, easy to explain. And I think that um, I would encourage cities to uh, make sure that the employers in your city do obey that law. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments. So I have three cards here that are somewhat related, and I thought we would pose these questions to you. Um, one is really about, uh, in response to the Answer Coalition that you spoke about, and also um, Dan Paralek mentioned the progressive towns that we live in here in the East Bay. Um, the question is, why are we having such a hard time convincing people um, basically about the truth here, the truth about parking, and do you have some kind of an elevator pitch really to change someone's mind? Well, the elevator pitch I would make is what the city of Boulder does. Uh, and they, uh, when they put in parking meters in their downtown, they dedicated the money to pay for echo passes for everybody who works downtown. That is, they didn't fix sidewalks and things like that. They just said, here's a package we're offering is it, <laughs> to the downtown. Would you, if you take parking meters, we will use the money to provide echo passes for everybody who works downtown. So all the employers downtown are able to give their employees a free fringe benefit and no cost, tax exempt fringe benefit and no cost to themselves. Uh, and it had a huge effect in, 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 in uh, inducing, especially low-income people, to take the Echo Pass and take the bus to work. And the Echo Pass is not just for commuting to downtown, you can use it to go anywhere. You, it, it becomes a, a, a part of your life. You can go anywhere you want to on the bus for free. So I, I would say that, that finding out what people really want, uh, and I would suggest that for cities that, are, uh, that don't have any parking meters, or like in Berkeley, you're thinking of running the meters later in the evening, just tell the people, here's a package. We're not going to say the money disappears. We're going to say, here's what you will get for it. And then I think people will quickly change their mind, is that they can see their meter money at work, and they won't say that it hurts low-income people. It completely undercuts that argument, uh, because low-income people are the ones who would be more likely to use the bus. The high income people wouldn't take the bus, it wouldn't affect them. Uh, but I, I think showing everybody the money, and especially the progressive community, the well, greens on being progressive, and, you know, the self presentation is such an important feature of life in Berkeley, that if you <laughs> presented this as a, uh, a way to help especially low income workers, and to, to the extent that they did switch from a car 
to a, uh, using their echo passes or easy passes, uh, that frees up spaces for customers. So even though some merchants will say, well, if we charge for parking, then it'll drive people away. Well, it'll make more spaces available for customers if their employees <laughs> take them off. Does that help? Yeah, that's helpful. I want to follow up with another question. I'm oh, sorry, thanks. Um, someone else um, didn't find their name for this one, but they would like your take on the city of Houston, which apparently has no zoning code. And is that an ideal? It hasn't been studied, but the impacts of that are. Well, yes. Whenever planning's are at conferences and you know they've had too much to drink and it's late at night and they begin moaning about how ineffective planning is because Houston has never had a zone, and LA has had it for a hundred years and they look identical. What's <laughs> <laughs> the point of all this planning? Well, Houston is famous for not having zoning, but they have minimum parking requirements. And they're very precise. 1.333 parking spaces per dwelling unit for a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, so the planners go down to three decimal points exactly how many parking spaces are used. I think that the, the, for you political leaders, you ask the staff, well, how did you come up with this number? you will find some very embarrassed answers. But partly for the planning, the city councils have all passed them. One had passed in, in uh, San Leandro. It must have some political legs. But anyway, I think Houston has um, uh, had these minimum parking requirements, and therefore it really does make Houston look very much like other cities. But Houston, is quite a leader in another regard, uh, as is Austin. Uh, it's young planners who, as they say, drank my Kool-Aid and uh, <laughs> thought they could do something. And they have set up one of the most sophisticated parking benefit districts in a, a newly hot area called Washington Street. And they convinced the uh, merchants that we all put in meters and we'll spend the 60% of the revenue goes to pay for added public services on Washington Street and in the surrounding neighborhood, of 40% goes to the city, and they have a citizens' advisory commission on how to set the rates, and, uh, how to spend the money, and it's all on the web, all the minutes of the, the committee meetings. It, it, it's much more sophisticated than anything in California. Um, Austin does very much the same thing. It was a young uh, uh, student. She graduated from the urban planning program at the University of Texas, and she uh, thought, well, we could do this, and, uh, the Park Benefit District. She got a grant from the Texas EPA. Yes, there is one. <laughs> the Senate, you know, young people are often quite furious that they don't know that it, it's infeasible. They just think this is such a good idea, it ought to work. And so that they, they set it up on one street right next to the university. Oh, the, the university on one side, and, Sort of like Oxford Street, something like, or Bancroft Way would be like that, except that there are single family houses behind that. And the uh, uh, a very savvy homeowner association president figured out, well, if we could be included in this district, and our, the money could be spent in our neighborhood, even though the meters are only going to be on Guadalupe Street. So I think that once you realize that there is revenue that will improve your neighborhood, um, uh, even in Houston, uh, the, uh, the people will say, I see what you mean. Thank you, great question. A, uh, a bunch of these now come up around residential parking permit districts, and uh, particularly from Britt Tanner from SFMTA, and um, a few others have asked, so what do you do about neighborhood districts that are completely impacted by um, surrounding main streets and business uh, districts that do have meters, but it just doesn't make sense, you know, to control those spaces in the neighborhood with parking meters. Well, I like what they do in Santa Cruz, and Boulder was the first neighborhood uh, city to start it, is that uh, when you have a, uh, a permit district, uh, often the, the, the people who live there have to drive their cars away during the daytime so they can go work and pay their mortgages, and the spaces are underused. Uh, so, uh, Santa Cruz and Boulder and a few other cities 
uh, sell non-resident permits to park in those neighborhoods. They, they do a survey on any block that is interested in it, and they say if the occupancy rate is less than 75%, they will sell up to four non-resident permits that are block-specific. And the people who work in the businesses nearby um, can buy a non-resident permit to park on that block. And they usually charge per, per month, but the residents pay per year. And they can use that money to fix the sidewalks or whatever. So th these people who are parking in front of your house now, they're, they're not freeloaders. They're paying guests that it takes advantage of this extraordinarily valuable land. Uh, and it, and if the, if the, uh, the um, people who work at a grocery store pay a permit for a permit, and if it's farther away, it would be cheaper, they, they might be able to walk five blocks from the block where they, where they park. And then the space they occupied at the grocery store is now available to a customer. It takes advantage of, of this land. And so I think it, it's a bad idea to do what most cities do, including Berkeley, is to say two hours of free parking uh, by non-residents. It's hard to enforce, it doesn't yield any revenue, um, and I think it should become paid parking. And so that the, everybody who parks in, the, in your neighborhood is a paying guest, and that revenue pays for, for public services. So I think it's, it's just being more economical about the, the, the land that we have. So for places that don't have neighborhood parking districts like Santa Cruz and places, you know, um, like in El Cerrito, well, well, actually we do have one, but it's, it's on the cusp, it, it's, it's uh, ready to evolve. But places that don't have any kind of um, system yet, what would you recommend if there's, um, if, if the city's not there yet, can neighborhood groups just instigate creating a parking benefit district for the neighborhood? I, no, I think, I think it's a responsibility of urban planners to offer people these options, that it shouldn't be the responsible of the city, you know, the residents, to go out and do research and find out what San Leandro does. I think planners shouldn't tell people what to do, they should give people options of what to do. And I think that the city council ought to say, you know, ask, assign them this, this task and say, well, we hear that Santa Cruz has a good policy, and West Hollywood does it, and Boulder does it, and Tucson does it, and, and other cities are doing it. That, uh, how can we do that here in, that, and adapt it to, to Berkeley? Um, another question is, on a national level, since you do, since you are advising all over the place, cities all over are looking to you, um, how do we turn market price parking into a state federal movement? Are we forced to address this only neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city? Have you seen, what, what could the federal government do? Well, the federal government is paying for Go Berkeley, is paying for SF Park. I think that's what the, the federal government should do, is pay for pilot projects to see how they work. Because it wouldn't have happened without these federal grants. Instead of uh, so many federal grants go to pay for building parking garages or widening freeways or something like that, that is not a national uh, issue. There's no reason why, the, why people, taxpayers in Mississippi, should pay for a parking garage in Berkeley or vice versa. Uh, so I think that what is an appropriate role for the federal government, and they are doing it, is to fund these pilot projects that wouldn't have happened uh, but for the federal grant, and to evaluate it, and which they're doing now. They have an industrial strength evaluation process for SFR. <laughs> and it's a neutral party. I didn't have anything to do with it. You wouldn't want to hire the advocate to evaluate it, although I would like to do it. But, so I, I think that, uh, as Jay Primus at SF Park says, that SF Park, and now you're going to go work it, it's not a plug-and-play project. You know, it takes a lot of work from dedicated staff members to make these things possible. And if I had make, the Bay Area just got a uh, uh, FHWA pricing, a uh, variable price parking grant to do exactly that for our region on a regional level, uh, sharing data about who's got what um, parking data and getting it all into, ideally feeding into our travel models, and we're super excited about this. Valerie Nepper's 
been the lead on that and a great leader on, on doing so. Well, I, I also should say that if, if agencies might transform that are doing most of the heavy lifting. I, I don't know that you got any federal grant for this, but it's it's. Uh, we did get HUD. HUD. We did get a HUD grant for collecting hundred. Uh, data on 100 sites, so that's definitely helping. So I, th I think that is a research goal, uh, and it, uh, some state agencies could do it as well, but I think the role is to stop funding uh, capital projects that benefit only that area, uh, and leave it up to the taxpayers of those areas to do that. But if there's knowledge to be gained, then I think that the federal government has a very important role. Right, and we've got a lot of questions here. Um, uh, let's see, so with, so with smaller cities, there's, uh, for our, our northern cities, um, Healdsburg, Sonoma, Sebastopol, you know, it's, a, it's a big challenge for considering uh, price parking. Have you, what are the smallest cities you've seen out there that are you know, maybe more rural, um, that have been charging for parking? Well, really rural areas, I don't think that parking prices is going to be an issue, but there are a lot of very nice towns that, uh, well, I was speaking in Santa Rosa, another one of many places I went to, you know, trying to convince, be as convinced as I could, and nothing happened. But anyway, I, I thought it was a, a very nice <laughs> town, and uh, usually the, the way I try to explain the options they have, and they're like, do you want to more like San Francisco or like Los Angeles? <laughs> and, you know, the most cities in Northern California know what they want to look like. But, or do you want to look more like Portland than Los Angeles, if you're farther north? Um, that I think that we really do have two diametrically opposed policies that LA require. Say, downtown San Francisco, there are maximum parking limits with no minimum, and LA has minimums with no maximum. If you have a minimum with no maximum, the planners are saying, the only problem we could possibly have is not enough parking. If you have limits with no minimum, the planners are saying, the only problem we're going to have is having too much. Well, uh, for a concert hall in downtown, you know, our famous Disney Hall in, in LA, the uh, uh, parking garage cost $120 million, and it was built seven years before they got the money to build Disney Hall. In fact, the, 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 fun, the, the lack of funds for Disney Hall would have been solved by using the money from, that they wasted on parking to, to, to build the Disney Hall. Whereas the Louis Davies Hall here in, in San Francisco is the equivalent hall that has uh, no parking. And for the parking requirements for Louis Davies Hall and Disney Hall is that LA requires, as a minimum, 50 times more parking than San Francisco allows us the maximum. <laughs> Said the other way around, San Francisco's maximum is 2% of LA's minimum. Now, if this were a science, you know, if there were a doctor saying, well, how do you treat diabetes or high blood pressure or something like that, and somebody said, well, well, we should really have a lot of blood transfusions in one city and a lot of bloodletting in the other city. People would say, well, what's wrong? What's this? this isn't science. Uh, but the parking, anything goes. Uh, the, nobody seems to pay any attention. I think, I think people's uh, level of mental functioning declines to a lower level when they talk about parking. You know, the, the accountant would say something about parking that would be ridiculous if said about counting. I think people use the reptilian cortex of their brain to talk about parking. It was a sort of a very primitive part of your brain. It was the kind of the, the first part of the brain to be developed to make snap decisions like to avoid being eaten. Uh, that, that really no, no reasoning involved, just snap decisions. And it, it, it governs thinking about territory, a ritual display, and mating, or something like that. There's no higher functioning. And uh, I think that most people think of parking only as a personal issue, never as a policy issue. Uh, so um, I, I, I think these differences between LA and, and, and San Francisco show as, as brilliant as possible that somebody's got to be wrong. In fact, it was wonderful when I, 
when SF Park started, the, the, uh, they had a splendid ceremony in the, the city hall, which was beautifully restored, full of light, and the mayor was there, and all the, the, the um, council of the supervisors, of heads of agencies, and they all raved about SF Park, putting in parking meters and charging market prices. Can you imagine politicians doing that? And then they, it was nice enough they invited me to, to say something at the end. There was nothing more to, to say, but I said that if SF Park works, it, it was just, just another feather in, in uh, San Francisco's cap. It would be the, make the place a better place to visit and live in and do business in. Uh, just, uh, just another nice thing about San Francisco. And San Francisco has the best of both worlds, because if it doesn't work, they can blame it on a professor from Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody laughed at that. In LA, they would not know what you meant by that. <laughs> in LA, we think of San Francisco and the Bay Area, just another nice thing about living in LA. We can go to the Bay Area, just like we can go to Palm Springs, or the Bay Beach, or Ojai, or Santa Barbara. Isn't that, aren't we lucky? <laughs> All right, this question is um, kind of related to the uh, lenders and banks and in the communities where parking requirements have been reduced, um, often lenders have been a roadblock to financing those projects where less parking uh, is, is included. Um, uh, and so do you see that changing in the future? Uh, people say that without having any hard knowledge of it. Uh, that where people have actually studied, Rick Wilson, uh, actually looked at developments in Southern California and uh, said, did they ever provide more than the required parking? It's very rare to provide more than the required parking. Uh, I was on the design review board for Westwood and I think in eight years I never saw a building that provided more than the required parking. Usually it's the required parking that limits the number of housing units you can provide. Because you can't get the, if you're allowed eight units on site, you can't build eight units and 20 parking spaces. So it's the, the parking tells you how many, how many housing units you could have. Um, because you, you could have only one level of underground parking, and that's the fixed number of cars. But um, I, if people believe that that the um, uh, cities remove parking requirements, like San Francisco, the, well, the lenders obviously don't require <laughs> parking in San Francisco for new buildings that don't have any parking. In fact, I was in Portland, yes, and they said that they had some resistance from lenders who, who would never see a building with no parking, and they got lending from San Francisco. Uh, so, I, people think that the lenders, and, and they rightly should look at the, all the aspects of the building, they, what they really do, the lenders really make sure that the building has all the required parking, because if it doesn't, when the thing is built, there may be challenges to the legality of having built it. Uh, uh, but I think that if people think that lenders are, 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 are forcing up the supply, then why do cities have minimum parking remarks? They're not necessary. If, if people believe that lenders are the barriers, then why should the, the city throw in another barrier? Hmm. Great. Um, we are actually getting to talk to a bunch of bankers. Actually, the Federal Home, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank is on our advisory committee, and fortunately, they've been giving us guidance on what proper data to be collecting as we're doing this uh, parking organization. Um, and a lot of lenders. You know, are definitely moving, and we're collecting the names of those who want to see less parking in projects. Actually, San Diego, actually, on your Shootista's page for Facebook, if you want to get really into uh, parking, folks mention this, and it, the the lender literally wanted less parking in that project. So it's happening, just like every every you know, there's different people out there. There's all kinds of developers, lenders, and everyone's. Um, you just gotta find the right folks and talk to each other to get those names. Um, so I think we've got so many questions and unfortunately we're out of time. Um, I just wanna thank Dawn so much for being here.